Um, this talk will be uh, a journey uh, for you. I want to introduce you to a new concept uh, for this morning's talk called Jelly Bean Work. So this is, I hope, the first time we're going to talk about jelly beans in the workplace. But uh, the idea is I'll explain exactly what I mean by that. And really what we're talking about is this collision between people's actions and area of a change in the future, divided the emerging technology and then the physical environment. And that's what defines the future of work, those three colliding forces. And I think what's clear to me is that there are seven now external forces that we think are reshaping the world of work and defining what we call this new world of work. And those seven forces are on the screen, I won't go through them in detail. I'll just touch mainly on technology today, but I'll also show you some examples as to where some of the other forces are changing work. But this is very much about our paradigm and the research that we do are based around these uh, seven forces and there's much more we can share with you uh, after the event. <coughs> um, just two slides for, for our credentials for talking about the future for you today. Um, we founded a, a range of businesses almost 20 years ago, so we spent the last 20 years predicting the future, especially around how technology will change, both the way we live, work, shop, and enjoy leisure. And we've worked for well over 1,000 corporates over those 20 years, all over the globe, and we've also introduced this conference, WorkTech, now to 15 global cities, uh, ranging from Santiago to Shanghai uh, to, to Stockholm and elsewhere. And finally, I write a book every two or three years with my co-author, Jeremy Myerson. We spend our lives looking around the world, finding innovation, talking to organizations that have made big changes. And the books, as you can see, have now appeared in almost every language you can imagine, from Mandarin and Korean to Russian, Italian, German, and so on. So what excites me is this is a global phenomenon. This is now something we're seeing in every part of the world. And uh, places like South America are exploding with innovation in workplace. So I'll share a few of the things I'm seeing, which I think are particularly exciting. And with technology, let me dim the lights a little bit more. Um, with technology, what, what I think is key is how quickly things move on. Um, this is a shot of St. Peter's Square in Rome. Just look at the difference for the Pope's inauguration from 2005 yeah. to 2013. And I think we forget how quickly it is that people adopt new technologies. And The Economist, I think, sums up very well the mood back in that era. This was 2005, and in fact, <coughs> Philip and I were on stage around then with Nicholas Zenstrom, who was perhaps the pioneer that killed the idea that you could charge for phone calls across the world. The Economist, a few weeks ago, I think last month, had this front cover, which to, to, to me exactly summarizes where we've got to in our journey. You know, while technology was killing established IT industry, is it is now about to disrupt fundamentally how we work. And I think we're at this turning point today, which I think is very exciting for us uh, in this room. So what does that mean? Well, look at this incredible transition that we've had in technology. You, you forget how, how quickly things like Netscape Navigator um, have moved into the web experience that we have today. So today's talk will try and predict the next 10 years for you and the big shift that we're going to see next. And I think one of the things that's driving that shift is, of course, the cloud. And most of you are now cloud adopters. You are using Flickr or Google, uh, Salesforce or, or, or Facebook and so on. And software as a service, as it's known, these are just some of the many players in that world. And consumption economics has changed the face of technology. You, you now pay per person per use or per person per month. There is no capex anymore to launch a new technology platform, which is a fundamental change in how you invest in technology. We think the same will happen in workplace because you also now have players down here in what's called infrastructure and platform as a service. The idea of Amazon Web Services means that you no longer buy your own data center. You have no infrastructure of your own. So could the same now happen to workplace? Could we begin to variableize another piece of infrastructure in business, i.e. the workplace? And we're seeing early signs that workplace as a service could well be part of our future. Today, with new ways of working, you're seeing a dramatic reduction in both capex and opex as organizations lease less space up to 30 percent we're seeing globally and also reduce the cost of operations by reducing churn and other factors but there are now new players uh, liquid space in uh, silicon valley has really catapulted itself as a player in software mirroring workplace so workplace as a service they are aggregating spare space and letting you book space 
based on price and demand. And then I'm moving into resource management, space management, delivered from the cloud, probably for free to organizations, and transforming the way we manage space in the future. And people like Accenture are beginning to use liquid space in anger for their global workers to change the way they use and buy space, no longer owned or leased by a corporation at all. And this kind of creates this idea of a thinner building. It creates an idea that organizations, we think, will slim down the buildings they want. And with the cloud, those buildings will be much less technologically enabled. There will be simple spaces for people, and all the technology will reside somewhere else and be delivered from the cloud. Not just infrastructure, but data and the software to actually manipulate that data. And that's a fundamental change from where we've been before. <laughs> The raised floors, the power, the cooling, all of the infrastructure and buildings to house technology we've had for the last 20 years, we think will slowly vanish as the cloud kind of takes over. And of course, Facebook and, 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 and LinkedIn and Twitter and the cloud or, or oriented social networks are now driving a lot of that change. Um, we're well aware that Facebook's 1.2 billion uh, members has a huge, powerful, big data set, and big data will now be part of what we, we discuss for the future. Uh, Facebook told me recently that their big play now is, is fascinating. For example, if you are selling Audi cars, and you are a dealer, and you sell 30,000 a year, if you profile those 30,000 customers, give it to Facebook, they will churn out for free a million people, just like the 30,000 who might buy Audi cars, and they will offer your car to those million people at no charge whatsoever. That's a remarkable change in marketing and advertising. And what will Facebook get? For every car that they sell, they, they, they get $1,000. So all you're doing now is paying for success. So big data will change the face of marketing and sales, we think, quite dramatically, as it's changing the face of the world. I mean, people are now in a very interesting state with, with, with social media, and it, as you're well aware, it has changed so much in terms of what we see in the Arab Spring and what's going on in Ukraine and so on. It's now being driven more by social media than, than by the old-fashioned revolutionary tools. And I think what's going on, of course, is this acceptance, especially by a younger generation, of a lack of privacy altogether. And one of the one of the websites which really fascinates me at the moment, which I'm seeing drive up, um, is this one um, in terms of lack of privacy. Uh, it's a big debate. It's a, it's a website saying, I've, I've just made love.com, which <laughs> intrigues me. Um, in, in London, um, we, I looked the other day and about 340 people had shared their moment uh, in the last few hours. Um, I was in Australia recently, which was a slightly less ex 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 impressive 67, but Berlin yesterday, uh, here, was uh, a very impressive um, uh, figure, although I'm not quite sure what was going on here in Luxembourg. But, uh, um, and of course, it's not just what you're doing, it's, it's, it's a bit more detail as well. Um, <laughs> that people are sharing in their hundreds of thousands. Um, and, and so it, it intrigues me that social media will be much more than we have had in the past. And KLM, uh, our Dutch friends, are now letting you choose your seat, not by window or aisle, but by who you might know on Facebook or LinkedIn. And that will get more and more prevalent, we think, in the future, using social media in a physical space to kind of join people together. So what, what the, the story today is with Jelly Beans is you can, for the first time with these networks, identify who knows who and who's connecting to who. So this is a, a map of an email exchange server inside an organization. So you can see straight away that all these red dots, and this is a major organization, they're all emailing each other at high volume it could be an acquisition, and these are lawyers and finance people and others in an organization working on this acquisition together. For the first time ever, you can use tools to look at the real business that's taking place. So as, as property specialists, why don't we accommodate those people together? So for the first time ever, you can say these people through our networks should be together, and that reduces email overload. And this then mirrors some of the really great research coming out for people like Stephen Johnson, who say that the best innovative places are hives of activity, and he talks about the adjacent possible. So you need to get that adjacent possible working inside the organization. So we think that the old-fashioned way of accommodating businesses and firms and, and, and corporates is, is, is archaic. You cannot look at the, the kind of the corporate structure. And as most architects tend to have to do today, you put this department next to this department on the same floor plate, because that's the easy way of doing it. And you create a building that represents that. 
And that's totally wrong. You need in the future to create buildings that represent this. The building itself will be a huge physical LinkedIn or similar environment. I can't wonder what else is going on. I mentioned the Quarry's fantastic new building in London, which I'll come back to. But in effect, they built a, a big social network physically inside their new London headquarters at, at, at vast expense, as you can see. And it gets more exciting still. This is a, a, a new, incredibly well-funded startup in the States called um, Relationship Science. And this is a new social network because no one has put themselves in it. This is automatically created from big data. So what relationship science is doing is they are just absorbing all the public data that's out there and finding the most influential people in the world and automatically creating a network, which then gives you three degrees of separation. So I can put into it anybody from a president to a, a senator and it will tell me the three steps to get to that person without them ever wanting to kind of publicize their details. And this is now being used dramatically. If I want to talk to Reid Hoffman, who's one of the classic investors and founded LinkedIn, um, this is a, a guy we work with, Greg Lindsay. He's just put his, uh, himself in, and it shows you that with two, two steps, he can get to Reid. Or through Mark, who we also know from Liquid Space, Reed, that he can get there directly because it turns out that Reed Hoffman has invested in liquid space. So these systems are going to model a very different world of relationship sciences that we all now need to look at for the workplace. And this kind of this maps onto physical environments that then begin to know who you are and where you are inside buildings. Buildings will have reactive intelligence. It'll start with kind of simple things like wayfinding, but very soon you'll be using things like this. This is um, Ben Weber's uh, company, um, Sociometric solutions at Harvard MIT breakaway and they developed an active badge that goes around your neck here and it doesn't just know where you are in the building uh, it also listens to what you're saying and knows who you're facing or talking to so you can look at a building floor plate and see who's talking see who's walking and sounds like Big Brother but it's measuring both individual and team performance in remarkable ways and people like Bank of America are now trialing these in North America um, for some far too far but for others it's a very new paradigm for how you measure performance and it's all about innovation uh, what's driving it is not monitoring people but helping them achieve new connections the big word in the states is now engineering serendipity so everyone in the West Coast is talking about how do we engineer serendipity inside businesses and between businesses in new kind of co-working spaces. And, and when you look at what's going on, um, one of the things I love is Google's new self-driving car and others who are doing the same thing. Uh, that's what the car sees uh, with its sensors. And when you look at the cars on their test tracks, the stuff they have to carry, which are now embedded, to let them navigate without a driver is very, very exciting technology. Um, what excites me about this car is it's, it's, it's real, obviously, it's on, the, it's on the roads in Nevada and California, but Uber, which is a fascinating new app for taxis, um, has just placed an order for a thousand Google driverless cars. So this is happening and will come very quickly. But what excites me is how you can adapt this into the office. You can now put this technology on people inside the workplace. Today, it's not great. Um, but, but tomorrow, of course, is this. Yeah, we're all well aware of what's beginning in terms of wearables. There are now 30,000 people with Google Glasses in North America. And we are getting punched in bars because, of course, there's a bit of controversy around them. Um, this will be the big new brave world. And what's inside the iPhone is very exciting. When you break it down, the three things that really are exciting are the barometer, the accelerometer, and the gyrometer. And those three miniaturized technologies allow you to know what's going on. I'll come back to how you might use that later on. But they link into this new huge trend called the Internet of Things. And we have a big research uh, uh, project called Connected Real Estate, or Real-Time Real Estate, which we predict will be huge. And there are lots of technologies now driving the idea that miniaturized sensors can be put into inanimate objects and buildings and have a 10-year battery life at least, or be powered via ambient light or vibration, and therefore last forever. And some of the things that are moving towards this are things like uh, Bluetooth, new, the new Bluetooth standard for low energy, BLE. They begin to allow you through wireless to really understand what's happening inside buildings for, for the first time ever. Modeling, movement, 
interactions, densities, and a whole range of things. And when you see this live, this is a, a, a trial in a company in Singapore, the smartphone allows you, through positioning, to know exactly where you are on the floor plate and see around you, not just space and what's available, um, and you, you, you check in typically by touching a sensor, this is near field communication, but the killer is to see who is where. So in this space, once you're in there and you've checked in, you can see your colleagues and you can actually overlay not just their Twitter feeds, but their Yammer as well. So not only do you know who's in and where they are, you know what they're doing, thinking, or tweeting about. It's scary for some, exciting for others, because of course what then happens in a big organization is you introduce people, you engineer the serendipity. You say, that person's tweeting about something that you are, should or should know about, you should, you should get together. So for organizations which are knowledge-based, this is the next, we think, big wave of creating the encounters that will engineer success and innovation. And retail has jumped on this. Um, the retail world has really adopted this. Uh, retailers are now tracking what they call the MAC address, which is on your phone when you walk into a store. It's always on if your Wi-Fi is on. Um, they're getting you to check in here via Facebook. And as soon as you've checked in once, you're forever identified as an individual as you walk in. And it tells them not just what you bought historically from that store forever, but what you've been browsing online or on your mobile in the last few seconds or hours before you walk into the store. And that's happening today. Um, obviously, the retailers won't give you vouchers, but in the workplace, you can do new things. And therefore, Bluetooth Low Energy will be a key ingredient with this. And people like Apple have now introduced this to their stores. Apple's launching iBeacon. Anyone come across iBeacon yet? I don't think that's been widely publicized, but they've certainly briefed us. iBeacon is their new technology. It's built into every Apple device already, and it's in every Apple store globally today. And that's what it looks like. It's a little a thing made by a company called Estimote, and it shows you with Bluetooth Low Energy, products interacts with you as you walk into a physical space. And this will get more and more exciting as, as we go forwards. In effect, kind of covering a city, a campus, a building, or an area in this kind of connected bubble in which things and people will all start to interact in a very different way. And of course, the dividers we carry, whether it's one of these or, or one of these, will always be on. Uh, wireless will be kind of unconscious, and it will begin to allow you to do new things based on identifying who you are and your preferences and your connections and so on. So one of our big uh, ideas, of course, is the death of the telephone. Uh, we think that that will go, and very quickly it'll just be software. Um, and, and the software, of course, will be driven by not just uh, numbers, but people. And here's where the jelly bean comes from. It's the presence indicator, which today is fairly basic. We think will get very complex quite quickly as it draws information from social media, presence, calendars. So the jelly bean is your defining factor that can al al allows you to think about how you connect through what medium, with what etiquette, and at what time. And it will just be a window to the cloud. It, the, the workplace experience will be a window. And the jelly bean will appear in real time in documents. Here's a Word document with Microsoft where people are co-authoring in real time. And jelly beans can then show you if you can speak to them, instant message them, or leave them alone as they're working with you synchronously. So you begin to have to ask yourself, you know, what color is your jelly bean? How do you want to define yourself through your working day? And the screens, the window to the cloud will get better and better. Um, the, the, the envisioning center here in Microsoft has got some phenomenal ideas, and we're seeing these incredible screens where you can interact with them, you can touch them, you can walk up with a with the portable device and just unfold what you've got, wipe it onto a bigger surface, and continue working. So we're seeing some clever things. Now, when organizations are adopting some of these ideas, this is National Australia Bank's new social media command center, so a specialist space in big organizations to manage this new world of connections and social media and so on. So one of the key trends, of course, is the slow death of the meeting spaces we have today, and instead much more vibrant and um, exciting spaces, places for people to, to come together, to work, to interact. And as you'll hear from Microsoft, things like Link are now transforming how we'll do that for the future. And therefore, the companies that are innovating are, are huge and numerous. And I just want to give you a, a few snapshots. 
It's, not, it's, it's in every industry now globally. I'm seeing pioneering examples all over the world. Um, Eversheds here, a major law firm, has gone out to a different way of working. Um, they've given everyone mobility through headsets and advanced telephony. Every single fear now carries an iPad. Um, they're looking at the desk of the future at the moment, and we've just prototyped um, this for them, because of course, one thing they're now worried about is what happens when cameras are on everything, and video conferencing is spontaneous. They found that you can, of course, freeze an image across the office on a whiteboard or flip chart as people video conference. So they're beginning to experiment now with a backdrop. You can pull out a screen when you want to do a video conference, you can swivel the desk around, and in, a, in, a, in effect you can create a small kind of studio within an open working environment to prevent privacy issues with cameras being used for ad hoc link based uh, conferences and others like WebEx and so on. Um, you'll hear from Vodafone, but one of my favorite recent buildings is Amsterdam. Um, it's a wonderful space. Uh, it, it, it lives and breathes the brand. And what I like is it means that Vodafone shows what they do within their own workspace. You know, they provide technology for mobile working. And so therefore, one of the spaces has a train carriage with great spaces on the train to sit down, to work, to interact. So you kind of empathize with the brand. Macquarie in London, I, th I think, is a great example of one of the first buildings created to emphasize people and networking. This was a standard spec, brand new building, and they ripped out six floors mm -hmm. and put this incredible staircase in, uh, surrounded by spaces, meetings, cafes, and so on. And the chief exec says that whole costs him £3,000 per person per year for the empty space. But of course, for him, it's worth it because it's all about people connecting. So here's a first example of a building being shaped, created for physical interaction. Um, and we're now seeing lots of that. This is um, uh, Helbersmith Freehills in Sydney, their brand new building. Again, they've ripped out huge chunks vertically in the building to create those interactions and linkages. And here, uh, a brand new building in uh, Melbourne for the National Bank of Australia, um, National Australia Bank, um, a phenomenal building. Um, the entire ground floor is now unsecure and public with over here at the back a huge co-working space, cafes, bank, of, bank branch of the future. And you can just tell from the volume that the space is all about people, interaction, movement, transparency. And of 6,000 people in this bank, not a single one has their own desk. So this is about a very different paradigm shift from where we've been today. We're finally seeing a, a huge uh, growth of the approach to well-being and back to those sensors, people like Bupa are now giving uh, employees as a trial things like ActivePal, a small sensor that's just got an inclinometer based in it. And the inclinometer says, am I standing or sitting? Simple as that. Because they're looking at the benefits of standing, working, and walking around buildings in terms of burning calories and therefore reducing obesity and also providing well-being. So we can actually measure this, and there's some big trials underway which we'll present at WorkTex later this year, uh, both in uh, Asia-Pacific and, and in, in EMEA. But basically, if you can stand up and you can walk, that has huge impacts on your well-being. And this then links to food in the workplace as well. Another big study we're doing for Zurich Insurance is about the future of food in the workplace. And again, one of my um, uh, case studies is Google, and in Mountain View, they, they help you understand your diet, your well-being, they grow their own food, and they even allow you to kind of feedback to colleagues using your phones and NFC, what they call good feedback, as part of their program for well-being. So that's a kind of a glimpse of the future of work for you. It's an introduction to Jelly Bean working. It's the idea that we are all now about networks and people, and the buildings now will be one physical social network, we think, in the future. Um, it's much less Mondrian, which is where we've been, structured, blocks of space, hierarchy, and of course the future is Kandinsky. That's been your journey. Um, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.